All right, we're on example five. But example five is really just an extension of example four. Um, and it's more of kind of a strategy thing. If you remember on example four, our end product was a numeric slope at a point. We came up with one eighth. So the way we did it is we solved for dy dx first explicitly as a function of x and y, and then we plugged in, which is fine. Um, this one says to go ahead and find the same value by plugging in before you solve for dy dx. So our first step would be exactly the same. Our first two steps actually would be exactly the same. We would take the derivative of both sides with respect to x, feeling free to group the x's and the 4's, or the y's, I should say, on one side, and then taking the derivative of both sides. So I'm just going to copy this and come down here and say we're on this step right here. But because we're after a numeric slope, things will start combining a lot more quickly if you plug in before you solve for dy dx. But here's the catch. Um, you still have to show that you're plugging in a number. And if you can't do it by Leibniz notation, because we haven't solved for dy dx, you have to do it just off to the side. So you would say something like this, at the point 1, negative 3, colon. And you're indicating then that you're going from a variable expression to a numeric expression. So let's go ahead and plug in right here at this step. That's just going to be uh, negative 3 squared is 9 times 3 is 27. So you get 27 dy dx. That becomes minus 6 dy dx. And then minus 5 dy dx. And then that'll equal 2. So notice what we can do now on the left side is something that we couldn't do up here on the left side. All three of those terms had dy dx in them, but they had a different coefficient of dy dx, which made them unlike terms. But now, everything with a variable turned into a number, and now we have like terms, right? So now we can add them. 27 of those minus 6 of those is 21 of those. Minus 5 gives us 16 of those. <clears throat> so we don't have to factor it out and then divide through. We can actually combine it first and then divide through by 16, and we get dy dx equals 2 16 which is 1 8. All right, so we get the same answer. When would we know to do that instead of solving for dy dx first? Depends what our end product is. If we are after a numeric slope, then take the derivative with respect to x, both sides, plug in first and show how that you're doing it like that, and then solve for dy dx. And or if you're ever looking for the dy dx equation, sometimes it'll ask for that. That's where there's more algebra involved. A little bit more, not much more. Then you're going to have to solve for dy dx. So you have your options. So it's kind of a strategy thing again. You always want to size up a problem and be effective. If you can minimize steps, you're minimizing potential errors, and you're also um, saving time, you know, which is good. Okay, go ahead and do example uh, six on your own. We're trying to find the derivative at x equals one for this equation. Notice it's not solved for y. We could solve it for y, but it would be the quadratic equation, and it would require two separate equations. And so even though we could solve it for y, we'd rather work with one equation than two. This is a good candidate for implicit. So go ahead and do it. I'll do it, and we'll compare answers.
if you feel like you need more practice with the algebra, solve for dy dx first and then plug in. <clears throat> if you never practice that, you're not going to be able to do that when, when you need to. <clears throat> Hmm. I did a little rearrangement on the first line. I brought the x to the right, so it became negative x, and I brought the 2xy to the left, which became negative, in the attempts to group my y terms together. Then I took the derivative of both sides with respect to x. It goes in the front on both sides. Okay, so that's important. This has to be in the front on both sides. All right, so then I took inventory. I got two y's, so I'm going to have two dy dx's. So the derivative of y squared is, or blob squared, if you will, it's two blob to the first times the chain rule, dy dx. So just remember, everything that has a y gets the dy dx when you're done differentiating it. The second one, though, this is a real easy one to mess up. That's a product, yes? And so the question is always, how do we handle a negative in front of a product? Well, the easy answer is simply to let the negative 2x be your first factor and let y be the second factor. So what would be the derivative of negative 2x? It would be negative 2 times dx dx, which is 1. So just negative 2 times y goes along for the ride. Then negative 2x goes along for the ride. So that second term is still negative times the derivative of y, which is 1, times the chain rule dy dx, or just the derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx. So those two pink terms come from that one green term above. And on the right side, we get negative 1. Notice then we have three terms on the left, and the negative 2y does not have a dy dx. So in the next line, I brought him over to the right, and he became positive, so I wrote him first, 2y minus 1, and I factored the dy dx out of the double underlined terms, and then I divided through. And so there's your final answer. Sometimes on a multiple choice, you might be lining up your answer to answer choices that are in terms of X and Y. So if you know you've done it right and you don't see your answer, just realize that you could have collected your dy dx's and everything on the other side of the equation. If so, all of your signs are going to differ. So all you have to do is multiply by negative 1 over negative 1. And again, what it does is it just changes the signs of everything. So instead of 2y minus 1, you have 1 minus 2y over 2x minus 2y. So subtraction normally isn't commutative, but when you commute both the numerator and the denominator, uh, it's like multiplying by negative 1 over negative 1. So that, that either one of those could be your answer. Now notice there's another problem here. It says that x equals 1. Whether you plugged in right here after you took the derivative or you solve for it, you're going to need more than just an x value, aren't you? You're going to need a y value to plug in. So how do we find the y value if it's not given? Yeah, we plug it into the original equation. This is the relation between x and y. <clears throat> so it's still used to give you ordered pairs, graphical points, even though it's not a function of x. So let's just say when x equals 1, again, showing that we're plugging in, you get y squared plus 1 minus 2y equals 0. And if you write that in descending order, it's a quadratic, right? So you could get up to two different x values, and if there are two different y values. Sorry, if there's two different y values, we'll just compute the slope of both of them. But if you factor this, it factors into y minus 1 quantity squared. And so even though it looked like there could have been two different y values, it turns out there's only one of them. All right, so the point that we're talking about here is the point 1, 1. Now, most other x values are going to have two points associated with it, but this one only has one. So now, since I solve for dy dx, I can just use Leibniz notation. Uh, you could also say when x equals 1 and y equals 1. So that's another way to do it. <coughs> the ordered pair just looks a little bit cleaner. Uh, and then you plug in. I'll plug into the first one. So I get 2 minus 1 all over 2 minus 2, which is 1 over 0, which is what? D and E. So the slope is undefined, which means it's undefined because it's what type? 
Yeah, the graph of the derivative would have a vertical asymptote there, and it's because the slope itself is infinite. So what type of tangent line do we have that 1, 1? Vertical. If you have infinite slope, not 0 over 0, infinite slope means vertical tangent line. So um, there is, we'll just say there is, because we haven't named the equation, there is a vertical asymptote. I'm sorry, not asymptote. Those are easy to get confused. There is a vertical tangent line. Vertical tangent line at our point 1, comma 1. All right, so that's important. Not 0 over 0 means vertical tangent line. If you had gotten 0 over 0, you would throw the point out. You would just say the derivative doesn't exist there. That would be like a cusp. So the difference would be something that looks like this, like we've already seen. Here would be a vertical tangent line. Um, but if it looks something like this, that would be D and E. That's a cusp. So that would be D and E. So that's the difference. All right, let's see what this graph actually looked like. And then we'll verify our results. Go to our favorite Wolfram. See, so here's what I typed in. Uh, Wolfram alpha grapher in two variables. And it says, did you mean that? And I'm like, sure, I meant that. And it takes you to this large screen. And then you come down here to um, plot a function in two variables under three-dimensional plots. Click the equals bar, and it takes you back over here. All right, so let's go ahead and type it in. Y squared plus X equals 2XY. And my caps lock is not on, but today, by the way, is not only National Knee Day, it's also National Caps Lock Day. So let me go back and change these just to, just to celebrate. Oops. Maybe I shouldn't be celebrating. It should accept it when they're capitalized, not lowercase. Computing, computing. It used to show like effervescent bubbles here. It was a lot more refreshing. All right, so there's what the graph looks like. It looks like some kind of rotated hyperbola. And we said there's a vertical tangent at the point 1, 1. So here's x equals 1. If you go up until you hit the graph, boom, right there, that's where the y value is 1. Does it look like there's a vertical tangent there? Yeah, that's where the graph goes from moving uh, left to moving right, or it could be moving right to left. We don't know. Later on in the year, we're going to talk about parametric or vector calculus, and that's going to be when we have uh, something moving along a two-dimensional path instead of a straight line path. When we know the time value involved, we'll be able to discern if it's moving left to right or if it's moving right to left. But right now, we're just looking at the graph, and uh, there's a vertical tangent line right there. It appears there's also a vertical tangent line where? Maybe at 0, 0. Let's see if the equation would support that. If you plug the 0, 0 in for x and y, you get negative 1 over 0, right? Which would also be uh, infinity. So, yeah, that, that seems to support it. Uh, now, negative 1 over 0 would be negative infinity. So, I guess this is moving from left to right because it's decreasing and then the slope goes to infinity. The other one was positive infinity, so it must have been positive slopes, and then boom, positive infinity. So interestingly enough, yeah, it's a rotated hyperbola. All right, cool. So far, so good? Just remember, if it has a y in it, you're going to take the derivative like you normally would, and then you're going to plug in a dy dx factor afterwards, okay? It's the chain rule. Okay, so when your derivative, dy dx, is a quotient of two variable expressions, like we've seen, uh, you're going to get horizontal tangents when only the numerator is zero. Only the numerator is zero. You're going to get vertical tangents, as we just saw, when only the denominator is zero. If you get zero over zero, you throw those points out. Those are going to be cusps. And whether it's a cusp as a function of x or a cusp as a function of y, the derivative there does not exist, okay? So vertical tangents are only when the denominator is zero. Horizontal tangents are only when the numerator is zero, okay? So let's try it out. Example seven. The graph of the equation x squared plus y squared equals four is a cycle centered at the origin with the radius of two. Sketch the graph of the equation. So this goes back to algebra two, conic sections. Uh, 
The center of the circle is at the origin. Let me go ahead and show you the standard equation, just so you have it. It's x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. So this is going to be the equation of the circle with the center at hk and a radius of r. I don't know. That might be a pre-cal burden now in the state of Texas to learn these conic sections in um, pre-cal. But anyway, that is a circle that's centered at the origin because it's just x squared, y squared, hk is 0, 0, and r squared is 4, so r is 2. So to sketch it, all we have to do is go to the center, go up 2, go right 2, go down 2, and go left 2, and put those endpoints. And then we just complete those with little circular arcs in each quadrant, and boom, you have yourself a nice circle. <clears throat> okay, it says to find dy dx. Well, we could solve this one for y, can't we? There's only one y term in it, but because it's squared, when I take the square root, I'm going to have to consider plus or minus. So do you want to work with two separate equations or just one? Just one, good. If I work with two, I'm going to have to do plus or minus. The top version will be the brown piece, and the bottom version will be the negative radical. That'll be the negative piece. I don't want to have to work with two equations and then know when to use each one. I have a method for finding the derivative when either it can't be solved for y or I don't want to solve it for y. So in this case, I don't want to solve it for y. So here we go. Uh, d dx of, in this case, I'm not going to separate the terms before I take the derivative. I certainly have that option. I could call it y squared equals 4 minus x squared. But I'll just take the derivative as it sits. Oops, I didn't do that quite right, did I? There we go. d dx of, d dx of. Okay, the left side, it becomes 2x times the chain rule dx dx, which we don't need, plus the derivative of y squared is 2y times dy dx, which we do need. And on the right, the derivative is 0. Now we've got to solve for dy dx. So here's the term that has dy dx in it. We'll keep it by itself on the left side, and I'll bring the 2x across. It becomes negative 2x. And in this case, it's pretty easy to solve. We'll just divide both sides by 2y. So dy dx is negative 2x over 2y. But we can simplify that, can't we? It is negative x over y. So again, notice in order to find the slopes, you need to know both the x and the y coordinate. It says, using calculus, verify that the graph has horizontal tangents at the point 0, 2 and 0, negative 2. So if we were interested in where this graph has horizontal tangents, we wouldn't really need to use calculus. If we know what the graph looks like, there's a horizontal tangent up there, and there's a horizontal tangent down here, and we know it's going to be at 0, 2 and 0, negative 2, right? See that? Pretty easy to tell. Well, it says to use calculus. We want to verify it. So here we go. This is what you're going to have to show. dy dx equals 0. Well, that's going to be when the numerator is 0. So what do you want to do with the negative? you want to associate that with the numerator or the denominator? Yeah, it doesn't matter. I'll associate it with the numerator. So that's going to be when negative x equals 0, which now I solve for x and I get when x equals 0. Now, how do I find the y values that go with it? Because that's just an x-coordinate. So remember, I plug back in. My, my relation between x squared where x and y is that. That's the original equation. So when x equals 0, I plug it back into the original. I get 0 squared. Oops. I get 0 squared plus y squared equals 4. And if I solve for y, I do plus or minus square root of 4, which is negative 2 or positive 2. So I got two values. So what does that mean? That one x value of 0 associates with two separate values. So the points, so I'll say, so the graph has horizontal tangents. And then I'll say at, and we list the two points, 0, comma, negative 2, and 0, comma, positive 2. And can we verify that? 
Well, absolutely we can. So I'm doing this problem so that you again have faith in the method so that when we don't know what the graph looks like, you could trust the method. All right, using calculus, verify the graph has vertical tangents. Well, just looking at this, we know it's going to have vertical tangents on the x-axis, which is going to be right there at negative 2, 0, and again over here at 2, comma 0. So let's verify that. So now for vertical tangents, I want dy dx to be what? Instead of just saying 0, now I kind of have to say non-zero over 0, right? Because you can't just say that that equals non-zero. But essentially, after I say that, I'm going to set just the denominator equal to 0. So that's going to be when y equals 0. And then I plug those back into my original equation. And I'll say, so when y equals 0, colon, we get x squared plus 0 squared equals 4. And I extract both square roots, and I get negative 2 and positive 2. So the graph has vertical tangents. At, and now that one y value is associated with two x values, so negative two zero and two comma zero. And we know that to be true. Now, if you did both of these and one of them showed up as zero in both of them, then you're going to toss that point out because that would cause zero in the top and the bottom. Horizontal tangents are only when the numerator is zero. Vertical tangents are only when the denominator is zero. So if you get a zero from both of them, toss it out. Now, here's an interesting one. At what value of values of x is the slope of the graph 3 fourths? So let's see. If I come over here, I can kind of anticipate where it might be. 3 fourths looks like it's going to be a positive slope, so maybe somewhere in here. And if there's one over there, there's also another one over here somewhere. So it looks like it should be at a quadrant 2 and a quadrant 4 value. So how are we going to know when it equals something else? Well, Let's just set it up. dy dx equals 3 over 4. So negative x over y has to equal 3 over 4. Now, can you just say that x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 4? Can you just do that? No, because you can have different things that are simplified to 3 over 4 that aren't 3 over 4. Like, for instance, it could be negative 6 over 8. Negative 6 over 8 simplifies to 3 fourths, doesn't it? But x is not, you know, 3 and y is not 4. So you can't just associate it straight across. So here's what you do. You can't solve that equation because there's two unknowns, can you? But here's what you could do. Let's, let's solve for x. Let's multiply both sides by negative y. And I get uh, x equals negative 3 fourths y. This gives you a relation that must be true for the slope to equal 3 fourths. Okay, so what can we do with that? Well, if we have x squared plus y squared equals 4, it's kind of like substitution. We could have solved it for either x or y. I'm going to take that and plug it in over here now to the original equation. And we get parentheses, negative 3 fourths, y quantity squared plus y squared equals 4. And if we simplify that now, we get 9 sixteenths y squared plus, I'm going to put a 1 there, 1 y squared equals 4. And now we can combine like terms. 1 is the same as 16 sixteenths, right? So 16 plus 9, that's 25 sixteenths y squared equals 4. And now we multiply both sides by the reciprocal, and we get y squared equals 4 times 16 25 And when I take the square root, I do plus or minus. So I get minus. Now, these are all perfect squares. So when you take the square root of 4, you get 2. Square root of 16, you get 4. So that's going to be 8 fifths. We'll do plus or minus 8 fifths. All right, so now how are we going to figure out what the points are? Now, like we would for any good substitution problem, we'll plug it in there. So the points are 
Let's go ahead and plug in the positive 8 fifths first. When y is positive 8 fifths, x is going to equal what? If we plug it in up above, we get x equals negative 3 fourths times positive 8 fifths. The 8 and 4 divide out to give you 2, so negative 6 fifths. Okay? And let's do the next one. When y is negative 8 fifths, you get x is equal to negative 3 fourths times negative 8 fifths, which turns out to be positive 6 fifths. So the other ordered pair is positive 6 fifths and negative 8 fifths. And is that a quadrant 2 and a quadrant 4 ordered pair? Yes, okay. So I told you this was going to be kind of the most excruciating algebra that we'll do all year. It's it's just, it's tedious, right? It's tedious. Because you're solving for one, plugging into the other. We'll have fractions. Um, but that's essentially how we do it. Now, let me show you one quick trick here if we have time. We have about uh, two minutes, a minute and a half. I can actually figure out the derivative without using calculus. Would you believe that? Here's how I could do it. If this is 2, and that's 2, and that's negative 2, and that's negative 2, I can write an equation of this line that passes right through there. Yeah? What would the equation of that line be? Y equals X, right? Y equals X. I'm trying to find the equation of then the tangent line at any point X, Y. Right? So how do I find the, yeah, it's the normal line, isn't it? So how are normal slopes related? Opposite reciprocals. So the slope of that line is going to be um, the opposite reciprocal of this one. This point is x comma y. So the slope of that line is up y over x, just in general. I, I shouldn't have used y equals x. I'm running out of time. Uh, the slope of this line is up y over x. The opposite reciprocal of that is negative x over y. And that's how you can get the derivative from that without using calculus. Sorry, that was kind of anticlimactic at the end. Have a great day. We'll finish implicit tomorrow, so make sure you practice, practice, practice.